Over the past 48 hours, this is what has happened in China. The Iron Curtain has closed in on itself. Remember, Google, WhatsApp, Facebook, they don't operate in China, they are banned. So the Chinese have their own Baidu's and Weibo's and WeChat's operating there. Well, guess what they're doing? It's now been reported that any information that is coming out of India, which means the Ministry of External Affairs statements, Prime Minister Modi's speeches, information from uh, Indian of official sources, information from Indian journalistic outlets, is now being actively taken down by the Chinese on Weibo and other platforms that are used within China. Since the Chinese don't have access to information from the rest of the world, everything is filtered by grand servers that are in the control of the Chinese state. And they have now decided that they have something to fear from an Indian version of not only what happened at Galwan, but what is actually being reported within India about the situation regarding the Chinese economy and other factors. Now, we can well imagine why the Chinese would do it. We should also examine the question, where do the Chinese people stand on all of this? Let me quickly get in. Uh, Ambassador Sajana joining us, Professor Nalapath and, and General Katoj stay on with us. Uh, Professor Nalapath, now this is a known thing. It's a known fact that the Chinese don't allow any of these social media companies to operate and they simply created their own social media giants uh, which are valuable companies in their own right now. Why would they want to, for example, take down a Narendra Modi speech from these portals? Well, the fact is that if Narendra Modi is acting in a manner which uh, does not reflect uh, the, the view of what they feel he should be acting in, obviously they will do so and, 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 that, is, and, and that is going to happen. The fact is that if you go to China, for example, if whenever you have any critical reference China in any channel, I mean, even in the very few hotels that serve have those channels, immediately it's it's uh, it's blacked out. So this is absolutely no surprise that this is now happening. I'm only saying that this is further further evidence that uh, clearly we are moving into a situation in which and the Chinese. Why are they so worried about what is happening uh, on the border? If they were so confident about their version, they, they, they could have accepted uh, different points of view. But no, they do not want different points of view to come. So which really uh, it, it increases the, the feeling all over the world that the Chinese version may not be the accurate version. And so, the versions that are given in India may be more accurate. So, so you're so worried when you I have something I'm to hide. Okay, General Katoj, let me ask you the larger question then before I open the ambassador. The larger question is this. We keep saying, oh, look, these poor Chinese people oppressed by this CCP regime that is so horrible and so dictatorial. At a certain point of time, what is the question that has to be asked from the people of China on what it is that they are doing to throw off the yoke? Now, uh, very frankly, uh, you know, I do not see the people of China as upset as we presume them to be. Well, and the, one of the major reasons is that they've had great economic success. Correct. Now, where they have lost out really is in the basic freedoms. But uh, taking those basic freedoms, I guess the other things which they have got, I think many of them are quite inclined to accept that as a trade-off. This is the impression I got in my limited interaction with, uh, with the Chinese uh, at the shopkeeper and other levels. I spent about a week there or so. Now, having said that, uh, when you look at a normal Chinese, you don't find any level of starvation or you don't find any of those basic problems there. I think the problems are going to come up when they start losing their jobs. You see, that is what is going to really hit them when a person doesn't know what to do. And this is what is of concern to China, that if you start hitting them economically, uh, of course, we know that, uh, you know, as far as India trade is concerned, it, it is just a fraction of the total Chinese trade. But even if they lose $30 billion worth of trade with India, can you see that converting into number of jobs which they're going to lose in mainland China? And that is what, go, that is, what is going to cause problems to them. That is why they and, want and to... And more importantly, uh, where do they replace the trade? But I'm just trying to address this question because I want to address... No, they want to insulate the public. They want to insulate the public from what is happening outside okay. so that to some extent they will be able to suppress... Uh, okay, greed is a real thing. We are all human beings. Uh, so let's not be in denial, uh, Ambassador Sajanhar. 
that in some cases greed, in some cases just livelihood. I need to feed myself. And if the Chinese model of if, if people who want food and water are not worried about, about freedom at this point of time. But how long can we simply give the blanket excuse that the Chinese people are helpless because they are oppressed by a regime? When since for about 30 years now, we haven't seen any revolt in China and the few and far between people have been left abandoned to die in some cell somewhere and never to be heard of again. You know, Risha, my, uh, my uh, view is, my understanding is, you know, and I was in uh, China quite recently, last year, in fact, and uh, I've also had experience of dealing with uh, Chinese, particularly Chinese students, you know, wherever I have been and whichever postings I have been, the last one was in Sweden and all. I don't think they are uh, at all bothered about the lack of freedoms, you know, as we speak about it. They are really, in fact, very happy that uh, their uh, economic conditions are uh, improving. They have, uh, you know, if you see from 1980 right up to now, 40 years, you know, they've been, uh, the Chinese Communist Party has been able to deliver very good growth to the people. You know, this was the understanding of the West, America and all the other countries that let us uh, encourage uh, China, let us uh, help China to grow economically. And when they grow economically, then of course the people will start asking the right questions about, you know, human rights, uh, freedom of speech, freedom so of wrong call. Who, freedom of religion. Who do we blame? Carter, <laughs> Reagan, they made the wrong call. That you engage with no, them they and they'll become richer, so they start asking these questions. That never happened. The questions after Tiananmen have not been asked. No, absolutely. And you see, right now also, I think the people are so brainwashed. And, you know, the people that I have spoken to, you know, as I told you, students, youngsters, etc., they are highly politicized. They are highly motivated. They are highly nationalistic. And what they say is that China is uh, the uh, better model of governance to follow. All democracies are failing. They point at... Uh, United States, they point at the poverty in India. So they consider the people in China to be superior. themselves to be, you know, far superior and the governance system far superior. Permit me, Rishab, just to make one point here. Because right now what is happening is that at the moment you have about 80 million people in China who are jobless. The economy is not doing well, although they might have, you know, the first mover advantage. They have started doing well from April onwards. But we need to recognize that 40 to 45 percent of their economy, of their GDP, is dependent on exports. Correct. And uh, exports are not happening and are not likely to happen for quite some time to come, except for things like medical equipment, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, I agree with what uh, Dhruv said that you know what we account for, what India, uh, the bilateral trade relationship, it accounts for, it is uh, quite minuscule. But still, it is significant. You know, if you have a look at their bilateral trade, they have the highest trade surplus with the United States. That was about $400 billion earlier. Number two is India, which is at about 55 to $60 billion. So, you know, it is huge. In addition to that, you know, this is, we are talking about trade in goods. In addition to that are the contracts. The contracts are not included in this trade. You know, all the things that, uh, Rishabh, you were mentioning uh, just now in terms of... Yeah, which is uh, your, your power uh, power supply and this and that is not included in this, correct? PSNL and MTNL, those are over and above. And that is what sort of, you know, provides them with the sustenance. Okay, so, the so, orders, so, so, okay. so, jobs, so uh, Ashok Sajanar, the people of Hong Kong are in revolt. We are, the, 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 the Tibetans are fighting their fight, the East Turkestanis are fighting their fight, another... A person has been interviewed by the Sunday Guardian. I recommend you read that online uh, in, in this morning's paper. Uh, you have the, the people of Taiwan fighting the, the good, good, good fight. Where's the revolt in Beijing? No, the revolt in Beijing, I, I think it's, uh, it will be a long time in coming. You know, and we will be deluding ourselves if we think that, uh, that uh, you know, uh, by uh, uh, China engaging itself like this outside its borders. In fact, China's engagement with the outside world, in fact, is helping it to retain control over its people. You know, recently we have known that because of the COVID-19, there have been a large number of questions that have been asked. Did Xi Jinping handle it uh, well? 
uh, you know, what about his uh, total control over the system? There were some murmurs of opposition against Xi Jinping. And uh, that is why, uh, you know... Okay, so the bottom line, uh, Ambassador Sajana, is mind. that the murmurs of opposition would be only within his own core Politburo, not on the streets of Beijing. Uh, Professor Nalapath, have we, have we seen some turbulence in the... I'm told there is another lockdown in Beijing. Are we seeing some turbulence other than Hong Kong and Tibet and East Turkestan and the, and, uh, the rest of the territories? It hasn't happened. So I'd like to uh, exactly agree with what uh, General Katoj and Ambassador Sajjan Hart, who is a very perceptive observer of multiple societies, uh, are, they are saying. Uh, the fact of the matter is that so far the Chinese Communist Party has delivered in a way which, in my view, no other government in history has in a comparable period. The difference between China of 1980 and China of 2020 is vast. But the difference is from around 2017 onwards, China has been locked into a war with the United States. Today, United States, Japan, other countries are decoupling from China. Their financial systems are now getting decoupled. The Hong Kong window in which 70% of dollars used to come to China may soon be closed once the Hong Kong security law comes into effect. In that situation, there is likely to be a very marked change in the economic uh, fortunes of people in China. And may I say, Risha, the middle class in China, the Americans and the Europeans thought like, you know, the middle class, if they consume like them, if they talk like them, if they behave like them, they will think like them. Yes, they are thinking like them. The reality is British are very nationalistic, French, Germans, Americans, and now the Chinese. The middle class is the most nationalistic. And this, in my view, is a real problem for the leadership. Okay. They have fed the tiger of nationalism. They are riding that tiger and they don't know how to get off. So if there is any, any kind of a news report that, for example, Indian soldiers behave with exceptional courage as they did against their Chinese counterparts, if there is any dialogue in which the Chinese got the worst of it and the It'll Indians vanish. got the better of it, well, it's a very, you know, then the middle class they, is going to they... respond and say, why haven't you acted so that the situation is changed? It's reverse. That tiger is growling all over the place. Okay. And that is the big problem that, in my view, the Communist Party is now facing. Okay. Let the me... tiger it fed for so long is now becoming a danger okay. to the Communist Party. Okay. Let me quickly Party. open Sumit, Sumit on this. Uh, Sumit, uh, uh, sorry, sorry, you know, we are, we, are, we are short of time, but let me bring you in. Uh, the premise is simple. For some reason, all these, these chi Chinese social media is now being censored. They are purging whatever Narendra Modi is saying, what the MEA is saying, what Indian journalists are saying. What are they afraid of? Rishabh, uh, give me a minute. I want to explain this. First of all, uh, you know, why they are censoring it is because you can insulate your people from the external media. But if your own media talks a different language, you're worried. Now, why are you worried? The most important thing is, Rishabh, look at Shinzuku doctrine. Look at, you know, taking the enemy by surprise. Look at, you know, Take uh, you know throwing uh, take, taking the enemy by surprise. Look at all those theories and hypotheses of PLA and the Communist Party of China. Now this time around, the Indian government has you know smothered that to pieces because they never expected a response from the like this from the Indian soldier on the ground from the Indian Prime Minister who has not minced his words and said any aggression against India will be handled and handled with you know with, will be kind of handled with equal or proportional and more proportional force for that matter. The Indian external affairs minister uh, spokesperson says do not take any unilateral action against LAC. This is a changed India. They are all those myopic ideas, doctrines and the theories what China has been propagating. They have been rattled by India. They have been break, broken to pieces by the Indian Prime Minister. And Indian Prime Minister, Honorable Prime Minister has given the same statement what he gave in Pulwama that the sacrifice of these brave hearts will not go for vain. And in the words of diplomacy and in the words of diplomacy, the message is very clear. What have we done, Russia? We have moved our man, our machine, our air force. You are reporting, News X was reporting today how much of, you know, man, machine and air force is active in Ladakh. We have moved our navy. This was not expected from China and everything is not within, well within China, within the Communist Party of China, within the Politburo. Now, they don't want okay. people to know okay. all these so myopic ideas. I don't think I'm going they to welcome in China anytime <laughs> soon. If you Google my name, you know what you're going to find. Uh, so let me yeah. get in the, uh, Dhruv Katoj back into this conversation. Dhruv, General Katoj, I'm, I'm short of time, sir. 
but the reflective reaction or reflexive reaction of now trying to purge Indian references, Indian publications, the Indian Prime Minister's speech from their own internal consumption, what is that actually suggesting to you? Because we are not seeing a mass uprising in China, that ain't happening, but for some reason that they are edgy, that they don't want Narendra Modi to be heard within China. You know, uh, the way I look at it is when you are looking at the psychology, this is my view, within China, how does China treat its neighbours? In Chinese view, the neighbor is either hostile or it is subordinate. Now, when you're looking at the subordinate part of it, you're looking at Pakistan, you're looking at Nepal, you're looking at uh, um, Myanmar, Cambodia. You know, so long as that subordinate relationship is there, China is quite happy and will maintain a great facade. Now, they, they are actually hoping to put India into that subordinate bracket. But you have a leadership which is saying no. So our relationship with China is going to be hostile. And what China, in my view, has been surprised about is the reaction which India has said, it doesn't matter how hostile it gets, we will take it and you cannot carry on this way. Okay. Now, I think this is what is of concern to China. The way the political, the, uh, uh, the diplomatic, the political and the military leadership has reacted, I think this has caused okay. a certain level of concern. Ki if we do something now, we do not know what the reaction will be. Okay. Is, that, the, is, the, view, is, is Ambassador the Sajanar, is the feeling so? Because after a point... Uh, we had to. We had people who were collaborators during colonial rule in India, from Mir Jafar onwards. You could not run a country of 300 million people with 40,000 Britishers if we did not choose to cooperate. If we did not choose to cooperate, the same applied to uh, to Nazi Germany. There were collaborators, and the same applies to China as we speak. So, if popular revolt ain't coming anytime soon. Is there popular questionability that okay? You're fighting with Trump. All right, Trump is being unreasonable. Now suddenly you have a problem with Modi's India also. Does that at least reflect within China that, oh, hang on, hang on, or are they willing to take on a 14 front, 10 front, 11 front, global, global, uh, hostile war even? You know, earlier, uh, Rishabh, they would not take uh, on more than a two front thing. That is why you would remember that when the US-China trade war started, in 2018, uh, the uh, Chinese Xi Jinping, he reached out to India and, you know, we had the Wuhan summit, etc. Because uh, China at that time wanted that, you know, they should open one front at a time. They did not want to take on India when the U.S. Uh, was sort of, you know, glaring at them. Today, they find themselves strong enough. But, you know, as far as India is concerned, I would like to mention here, underline, you know, when they had the last uh, confrontation with India, which was in Doklam, 73 days, they really had to retreat with egg on their face. I think the uh, the uh, impression that their own people got in terms of how China had conducted itself was very humiliating for them. So as far as right now is concerned, they have come here to uh, humiliate India and to show to their own people because uh, Xi Jinping did not get a good uh, response from his own people. And if this sort of a thing has happened, as okay. one of your uh, 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 panelists was also mentioning, that, you know, our people gave such a good account of themselves that although they were heavily okay. outnumbered so, so, and also that they were so taken by surprise. As far that, as WeChat and Weibo are concerned, a Narendra Modi speech is now a threat to their national security for some reason. It's for them to figure it out and for the Chinese people to figure it out why they allow the CCP uh, to, to, to censor everything. Uh, what I'm only suggesting to the course of this debate is, let us stop thinking that the vast majority of the Chinese are to be somehow pitied or we should be very empathetic because they are under some regime and no, they are no, being badly all. oppressed. No, they are by all means collaborators because it makes them richer and they have their own nationalistic sentiment and is information to them very deeply censored and filtered? Yes. Is there brainwashing? Yes. Is there propaganda? Yes. Is it a free country? No. But that's their problem. It's not our problem. Our job is not to free China. We might have a cause to support in Tibet or in East Turkestan or in Taiwan. But it's for the Chinese people to figure out how they run their country. And if this is how they choose to do it, well, then they should not be carping about India. Gentlemen, thank you very much for having this conversation. For more such videos, subscribe to the NewsX YouTube channel, hit the bell icon.